This is Gospel Bound, a podcast from the Gospel Coalition for those searching for resolute hope in an anxious age. Wherever you're listening from, welcome. I'm your host, Colin Hansen, and I'm glad you're here for today's conversation. What is faith? Is it a feeling? Is it hope against hope? Belief without evidence? Well, Jen Michelle says faith is a habit. It's not against evidence, but careful consideration of evidence. It's trust in the story that makes sense of the world. It's curiosity. It's where the habits of humility take us. Try practicing your way into faith. That's what Jen Michelle writes in her new book, A Habit Called Faith, 40 Days in the Bible to Find and Follow Jesus, published by Baker. Go to church, she says. Follow the liturgy. Act the part. Let habit take you by the hand and lead you to God. Michelle says that faith pushes back against the technological advances that convey the illusion that exertion is our enemy. In this book designed to help introduce the Bible to anyone curious about faith, Michelle guides readers on a 40-day journey through the wilderness of doubt to the promised land of hope and the promises of God. She writes this, We can feel small in this world and frightened by our smallness. The invitation of faith isn't to pretend that that there aren't big, bad, scary wolves, that life can't wreck with a sudden change of weather, that we don't feel angry or sad or disappointed, even occasionally abandoned. But it is to say that we keep at the habit of believing the improbable. We're not left or forsaken. God is with us. Uh, Jen Michelle joins me on Gospel Bound to discuss the terrifying and comforting Bible, happiness on God's terms, and the freedom of submitting to Jesus, among other topics. Jen, thank you for joining me on Gospel Bound. Yeah, thanks so much, Colin. Jen, what led you to see faith as a habit? That's a good question. I mean, I think I'm a good borrower. So I was really interested in Blaise Pascal's idea that, I mean, he essentially had this idea that habit could be the thing not just to sustain faith, but the thing to seed faith. And I ran across that quote years ago, and I thought, gosh, that's such a great way to think about it. Truthfully, it wasn't a way that I had normally thought about it, but I thought about it as something so helpful to people. Because as you said in your introduction, if you think about faith as a feeling, then you sometimes wonder if you don't have faith when you don't feel it. Or maybe you think that you could never have faith because you couldn't generate that feeling. And so I think the category of habit is a really hopeful one because it feels kind of practical. It feels sort of doable. What about you, the habit of writing this book? How did it change you? How did it shape you? I think, you know, one of the interesting things was just to start in the book of Deuteronomy, which is not a book that I was actually all that familiar with. And the project, I had the project kind of set before me. Really, it came out of a study of John. Um, I was preparing a speaking engagement on the farewell discourse. And that's when I started to, you know, digging into the research, seeing the connections between the Gospel of John, specifically the farewell discourse and the book of Deuteronomy. So I thought, oh, this would make a really, really interesting project, especially because there are these five verb themes that are connected between the two. But truthfully, I didn't have a lot of familiarity with Deuteronomy other than just hitting it every year when I read the Bible through (laughs) in the year. Um, And so I think that the revelation for me in this project was how beautiful Deuteronomy is as a book and actually how relevant Deuteronomy is as a book. One of the themes in Deuteronomy is just this idea of faith Um, being a means to life, uh, being a means to the blessing. A lot of people actually would say that Deuteronomy sort of fits in terms of wisdom literature. You know, the two ways, the way of wisdom, the way of the wise, the way of the fool, the way of blessing, the way of curse. And I was surprised to find that and actually so comforted, comforted, you know, to see Moses, to hear Moses preach to the people and say, hear the words of God, heed them, and they will be for you life. 
Well, speaking of blessings and curses there from Deuteronomy, you describe the Bible as terrifying and comforting. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, you get into a book like Deuteronomy and you hear God talk about, you know, taking the land. And that is going to mean, you know, ridding the land of the pagan idolatrous people and their practices. So automatically you're confronted with something that feels very anathema to the contemporary reader. You know, these are the kinds of arguments that people bring against the Bible. Well, the Bible supports violence. You know, it, it supports genocide. Um, and Deuteronomy kind of brings you right immediately into that question. It brings you to the moment where Moses prays to God, God, you know, just have mercy on me and let me get into the promised land. Please, 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 please. And God says, absolutely not. No, I'm not changing my mind on this. And I write in A Habit Called Faith that that's a moment that, you know, I really don't understand God. I really sort of feel like Moses needs a little bit more mercy. You know, I kind of think if you were to take Moses and compare him to the Israelites and you were to just sort of measure their faithfulness, you would say, gosh, doesn't Moses sort of get a bigger pass? How come the Israelites get to get into the land? And he doesn't. And so the Bible is just this book where to read it, to read it with an open mind, with real kind of curiosity and a real willingness to hear what it says, it doesn't confirm everything you want it to say. It absolutely doesn't. And that's what I mean by terrifying. Well, I recommended your book recently to a friend who said that he'd taken the last three months, read the Bible already all the way through for the first time. And he said that he was very disturbed. Mm. And I said, Oh, good. That means you actually read it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, I, don't know how, I don't know how you could read the Bible and not be disturbed. Absolutely. By a lot that's that's in there. Um, and then and then we got into a conversation where he was saying, well, I like the New Testament God a lot better than I like the Old Testament God. And I said, okay, let's talk further <laughs> about that. <laughs> and here's a, here's a good book on, on Deuteronomy uh, called The Have a Called Faith. And that um, that might help you to think through some of this. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of times if, if we don't see the Bible as terrifying, it probably means that um, we're just cherry picking some verses that yeah. we like. You know, a little bit of Psalms, the really comforting ones, definitely not Psalms of Lament. I was going to say, not most of the Psalms. Not, not, you know, not the <laughs> Psalms of Lament, maybe not the imprecatory Psalms, you know. <laughs> the, uh, that's the one of the most shepherd. disturbing books. <laughs> yeah, but even there, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow yeah, of death. True. I mean, even that is that's comforting. True. There's always this juxtaposition of judgment and grace. Yeah, absolutely. Throughout the, throughout the whole whole scriptures. I mean, let, let's keep on that theme. One of the one of the points you make in Have a Call to Faith is that we can't have happiness on our terms. Mm -hmm. But I guess the question is, why not? Because that certainly seems to be how just about everybody wants it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you and I have done our homework a little bit on Charles Taylor. And, you know, I think to just remove God from the picture means that the only person you really have to obey is yourself, right? I get to do the things that make me happy, the things that I want. And you throw off anything, any constraint, you know, to your own kind of individual, authentic desire. And this is just not the picture that we have in scripture. It's not the picture. And in, in that that's not just the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. This is following Jesus who said, if you would, if you would have life, you know, you'll have, if you want real life, you'll have to lose your version of what life is. Um, if you want to follow me, you'll have to take up a cross. And I think wrestling with this is kind of the journey of faith, which is really a journey of surrender. It's a surrendering of our own version of good. I think that's really what we see even in the garden. I mean, the very earliest story of human rebellion against God is this is this story of, of humanity wanting to reinterpret good on their own terms. Well, you know, God had forbidden this fruit. Eve cast that second look and says, it actually doesn't look all that bad. You know, it actually looks to be good for wisdom, good to it's beautiful. And, you know, I bet it's going to taste good too. So why don't I try some? 
that temptation is old and enduring to reinterpret good. And I think that one of the things that happens as we read the Bible is that it actually begins to reshape our interpretation of what's good. And I think that's super exciting. I think that it reshapes our loves, our loyalties, our whole kind of vision of the good life. When you're talking with people who are skeptical about religion, what have you found as a way of helping them to understand that happiness doesn't come from just looking further within, that that there's actually a problem with happiness on our own terms? Because it's clearly discordant uh, with the scriptures. That's yeah. that's clear. As much as people want to manipulate the scriptures to get rid of that, that's not that's not a faithful interpretation. But given that somebody might not even trust the scripture as an authority, what what have you found as a way of saying I I don't think you you actually want that, or I don't mm-hmm. think that's actually going to work for you. Mm-hmm. Well, I think in some ways it's as easy as saying, how's that going for you? <laughs> you know, how's that? How, I mean, really, and really, and that's, that's not to be snarky because I think I could say it to myself too. It's not as if I don't sometimes fall under the delusion of my life will be good if I have material security and comfort. My life will be good so long as my kids are successful and happy and well-situated. Um, But, you know, the truth is, I think it's like what C.S. Lewis said, that it's not the problem of life being dissatisfying when our circumstances are bad. It's the fact that life is actually dissatisfying when circumstances are good. We were left longing for more, even when life can be good to us. And so sometimes it's just a matter of kind of talking about that, you know, asking people. I think Jesus models for us the kind of approach we should have with people who are curious about faith is just to ask them questions. First of all, I never want to assume that I understand where someone is coming from or what they think or believe or hold to be true or value. And so sometimes it's just a question. It's it's always about questions. Um, You know, gosh, so I hear you saying that your children are your just you're putting a lot of your value in that. I don't how how do you have do you ever feel that to be disappointing? I, or do you ever feel that to be a fragile kind of hope? I know for me, you know, so this would be like turning the conversation, reflecting back my own experience of of truthfully life's disappointments, of where I've kind of cast my hope on something and it hasn't been strong enough to hold. And a lot of times, actually, also, that looks like sharing stories of grief. Um, You know, I've been recently in my Bible reading in 2 Corinthians, and I was just marveling again at this whole connection that we, when we suffer, we experience God's comfort. And when we're comforted, we are equipped to comfort others. And I think, honestly, that is a beautiful gift that we have to give to the world um, who they, whether or not people are always apt to initially admit it, I think as you are in relationship with people, they are able to say, gosh, it's my dreams aren't living up to being everything that I hoped they would be. And then you get to sort of talk to them in the place of that longing, that disappointment. Um, uh, and, you know, to talk about Taylor again here, that right. hope for the transcendent. Yeah, I was going to mention Taylor. We've already gotten him a couple times in the podcast. But I think what is one of the challenges that we face that it's not so much that people come in consciously thinking, I can either look outside myself or inside myself, and I need to pick which of those paths I'm going to take. Mm -hmm. It's that people, even as they're dissatisfied with the self-help concepts, just keep pursuing more self-help concepts. It doesn't appear that they they really doubt the premises. Exactly. They might doubt the outcomes, but it, it, it takes something else. And I, I, in my experience, it's often suffering that brings it back to say, it just, it's not going to work. These mantras, these incantations, 
these resolutions can't really deliver you from the body of sin and death. And, you know, there's just more and more burden of responsibility on the self. <laughs> you know, the self can never be at rest. It's interesting. I was talking to a friend recently who's not a Christian, and she is a physician and recently just had something happen at work that she just couldn't let go of. You know, she was bearing some guilt over that and just kind of kicking her self feeling like I could have made a better decision. Maybe there would have been a different outcome. And, you know, that's a moment. And I did, I said it over text. We weren't actually having a conversation, but in text, I said, this is one thing that I really appreciate about being a Christian, that there's actually a framework for forgiveness. Because if mm. all you have is the self, you know, the self is judge and jury and, you know, it's everything, you know, all the burden is entirely on the self to do better, to improve and to, and to absolve even, and to be a Christian and to believe that actually my greatest moral debt is not to myself. It is to my creator. And, and the paradox really is, is that that so great a debt could be forgiven. Christianity, nothing if not a story, a true story. One of the things you write in A Habit Called Faith is that we live by the stories we tell. Expand on that idea a little bit. How does that fit into your, your project here? Mm -hmm. I love, I actually pulled this book down and I I think that it's worth just a mention here, telling a better story, Joshua Chatra. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciate this particular perspective, especially on evangelism and apologetics, that, you know, we need to turn toward the idea that we've just, that Christianity is a story. It's not just, you know, this body of knowledge. It's not just this uh, bulleted list of facts, but it really is a story and stories captivate people. I mean, it's why... It's why J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, it's why everybody is so excited about this new Amazon show and and why his his storytelling, his world building is just it captures us because that's the kind of beings that we are. We're storytelling creatures. And so I think story exists. It, it touches us on a deeper level than the rational. And I think that is such an important piece that I am trying to do in A Habit Called Faith. And honestly, even in my conversations with, with um, skeptics and curious people, is to touch on the, on the longings, on the desires, and how the Christian story is actually speaking into that. Um, that it's not just, you know, this, this historical record of what happened through Jesus' life, although that is absolutely true. But it's also, I mean, to, to think about the explanatory power of the gospel, that it tells us something about why we're so, we're so anguished over the world being so broken. And, and, and C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity it touches on that. You know, why should we expect anything other than a broken world? If this is all we've ever had, this, this longing for a better world, where does that come from? And so I think it's at this level of kind of desire and intuition about what the world should be like and who we should be and how we should treat one another. The, the Christian story, it, it answers that. It has so much explanatory power. It has way more explanatory power than, than um, the, you know, we could say the Darwinian story, you know, for example. It seems like the, the two options that people prefer today are either to say that I can't really control everything that's happening in the world, but I can... I can improve myself. Mm. So whether it's fitness or what I'm eating or my mindfulness or my anxiety, you know, seeking medications, treatments, all those sorts of things. Seems like that's the option. Or the other option you have is the activist option. Mm. And these two things, by the way, can go, can, they can work with each other. Um, they can work at the same time. So the activist option is, okay, the problem is, well, it's just the wrong people. There's just bad people out there, and we just need to replace the bad people with the good people, no matter what. And clearly, the Christian story is very different mm -hmm. in those ways. Could you, 
I mean, I'm kind of setting you up here on my, my own <laughs> kind of premise, but how, how would you see the Christian story you know, through Deuteronomy, through John? How do you see that as being, what kind of contrast does it offer to those mm-hmm. solutions or answers? <laughs> You know, Deuteronomy is such a wonderful book because you do see the brokenness of the human condition. So what Deuteronomy is basically repeating over and over again, just all these sermons from Moses, you know, hear the words of God, heed them, in them you'll find your life. And guess what? Israel throughout her history has had these moments of, yes, yes, we will. We'll renew the covenant and we'll make all of these promises to God that we fully intend to keep. And the book of Deuteronomy is like, nope, nope, that's that's never going to work. And actually, one of my favorite verses um, from the Robert Alter translation, and nobody gets as excited about this as I do, um, because it feels so pessimistic, I guess. But you get to the end of Deuteronomy, and this is how Robert Alter translate it, translates it. Um, did he act ruinously? Speaking of God, th- speaking of like how everything's going to fall apart, Israel's going to lose the land um, that they've been promised because they won't obey God. So did God act ruinously when everything falls apart? No, his son's the fault. And that's how he he translated it translates that. And I think it's so poetic and so vivid. His son's the fault. You know, where does the fault for the broken world exist? Um, You know, it's like not in other people alone, but in myself. You know, let's be honest. I mean, even if I try to repair the world, well, there are lots of days I feel actually kind of contradicted about that where if we're really honest about what we want, we want for our own comfort and security. Goodness, I could talk recently. I mean, there, there's there been a really interesting expose about people who in the 1960s in New York City wanted for integrated schools. But when it came for actually sending their children to those schools, they opted not to. So, so you know, his son's the fault, his daughter's the fault. The, the truth is, is that I want a more just world, and I also want a world that's comfortable and convenient. Um, and the same is true for self-improvement, um, that, you know, there are days that I wake up and I feel very resolved, for example, as, and I, as I think most people, you know, there are days we wake up and we feel very resolved to do better, you know, to keep all of our good intentions. And then there are days that we wake up and we watch, we binge watch Netflix. Why? You know, can we, again, it's sort of this like broken, fragile thing that are we going to put all of our hopes and our own individual efforts or even in our own collective efforts? No, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't, I think that's a very fragile hope. Another concept that's very misunderstood, I think, and I know you would agree, um, is the, just the concept of love. One of the things you write in Have a Called Faith is that love can sometimes seem or feel severe. Yeah. And yeah, we've already talked about a lot of evidence of that from the book of Deuteronomy. Explain how we're supposed to understand a concept of love that includes severity when I think more or less we have in, in Western culture turned love into a synonym for affirmation. Yeah. This goes back to what we were talking about, that if there are real objective moral goods in the world, if there actually objectively is a good, a better life than another, you know, which is what the Bible posits and Deuteronomy is all about that, that if you follow, if you hear and heed the words of God in them, you'll find your life. And if you don't, it will be for your, um, for your ill, you will lose good things. You know, you will suffer um, if you choose to rebel against God. So this sort of affronts this idea that love, that this contemporary idea that we have of love, that I love you, Colin, when I just, uh, you do you, you, I affirm what you want as a good not because for any objective reason, but simply because you want it. And I think that's a really dangerous thing because if you want something that's actually not a moral good, 
that is it goes against the moral grain of the universe as God has made it, then for me to say, that's great for you, when I know it's actually going to lead you off a cliff, that's not loving for me at all to say to you. Now, of course, how I say that to you in the context of relationship is a really, really important thing. And one of the things that I think, again, is the beauty of Christianity, that it's never, well, I'm morally superior to, to you. Well, well, Colin, if you would only want the things that I want, if you would only choose the things that I choose, no, you know, we are together morally corrupt um, we stand to be judged by a holy God who, because of his mercy, his, his being rich in mercy, has chosen to love us and to forgive us and to set us on the path of moral righteousness. I think that's a really important part of the gospel, that the gospel doesn't just stop at, um, you've been spared the punishment you deserve for your moral corruption but you actually are remade. You're baptized now into the death of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. And that includes, you know, new habits of being, new moral habits of being, new patterns of loving your neighbor well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, I want to bring this toward the, the end. I mean, I, I wonder if, is there a point that I'm kind of setting you up here? Is there, is there a point where we no longer need faith? Um, we, we, find, we get all the evidence that we need. All our questions are answered. I do think a lot of Christians have that attitude, or perhaps that's even in my friend who said, you know, I thought I'd read the Bible, and then all of a sudden I'd see everything clearly. Now mm. I've got all the evidence. Now I don't really need, I just, I, I understand everything. Now, just what's the ongoing role of faith in this mm -hmm. habit as you describe it? Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important question. I actually have a child who currently is in a real um, kind of vital, I think, important stage of questioning. And I think that this particular child thinks that if I read all of the right books, if I satisfy, you know, somehow I'm going to satisfy all of my intellectual questions. And I keep saying to this child, no, that's, that's, you know, you're never going to be exempt from that leap. I mean, to be entirely cliche, leap of faith, this kind of, because faith is not just intellectual. It is a believing trust. I've, I've appreciated reading some people recently who are kind of trying to grapple with this word, this Greek word that is hard, you know, and I don't want to get into all of those debates because I'm not a Greek scholar, but I think what they're grappling with is this idea that faith encompasses trust. It encompasses surrender. And so if you think that you can just satisfy intellectual questions and be there, you can't be. You know, you need a vision of the resurrected Jesus. I really do believe that. I think you need to be called to him. And for this child and for other people in my life who do not believe, I just, I pray for them um, as if they were Saul on the road to Damascus, Lord Jesus Christ, reveal yourself to this person. You know, let them have a vision of you. And I think that there is something I'm going to say experiential about that. And that's not to to eliminate everything we've already talked about, that faith is, is more than a feeling. And I think it's more than exper an experience, but I think it's also true to say that faith isn't just, well, I've intellectually, you know, grappled with all of the questions. And so I have faith. No, you're going to have to leap into trusting Jesus to be the ruler of your life, the king of your life. Would it be appropriate, Jen, to describe you, what you're talking about in this 40-day journey as encouraging people to put themselves in the way of grace? 100%. Yes. I mean, habit, again, it, it can't be the thing to lead you. Uh, it can't alone lead you to God but it can be a means of grace. You know, the, the paradox of grace is that 
it can meet us as we're walking in the way. You know, we can choose to walk in the way. We can choose to take up some of these habits. The habit of reading scripture, I think, being very, very primary. But then we are entirely dependent upon the Holy Spirit to kind of pull back the veil and to allow us to see the glory of the risen Christ. That is a work that God must do in our hearts. But we can certainly, I've, I've sort of said it this way sometimes, you know, if grace is like a rain shower, you can get yourself outside. You just get yourself outside um, and ask God, you know, for the good weather of grace. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to do a final three here, Jen. We've been talking with uh, Jen Michelle, author of the new book, A Habit Called Faith, 40 Days in the Bible to Find and Follow Jesus from Baker. Final three here with Jen. Jen, how do you find calm in the storm? Oh, goodness. Well, we can talk about the storm of the pandemic, right? I think the storm of the pandemic really like turned over the boat. It swamped the boat for me. And I had a lot of anxiety. And you know what I did is I just was like, I got to think about what habits are really important in this season. Um, habits to continue, but also habits to begin and habit the habit of fixed hour prayer has become a really important habit for me during the pandemic. Something that I've done by myself, something that I've done with my family, and also with our small group um, at church. We had a season of just meeting over Zoom for morning prayer. Um, just so small, so ordinary, but so life sustaining and anchoring. Just a new habit of prayer for me has been really helpful during this storm. Second question, where do you find good news today? Oh, good news. Besides the gospel? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I I do. I mean, I don't want to be so cliche, but I, I do just find that I keep reminding myself about what is true in the world. Um, even to, to think about what's true against the horror uh, horrors of what's happening in Afghanistan. You know, I think about this drone strike. I think about these children that have, you know, died. I think about people who couldn't get on planes that might have wanted to. And I really do say to the Lord, how long, oh Lord? Mm. And the good news of the gospel tells me like not forever, not forever. That is good news. That is good news. Last question, Jen. What's the last great book you've read? Well, okay. I'll talk about a novel that I just read. Yeah, let's do it. I read a novel called Wayward by Dana Spioto. Spioda, I think. is the, And this is the first novel that I've ever read by her. I was introduced to it um, in an interview that Pamela Paul did on the New York Times Book Review podcast. Um, not a Christian book. And actually a super interesting book, especially with some of the work that I've done on place. The woman who's the protagonist of that novel, people have actually called it a menopausal novel. So I'll just say that it may have been resonant for me for certain <laughs> reasons um, because I'm, you know, 47, middle aged. Um, but the woman ch decides that she's going to change her life and she's going to change herself by moving into a different house. And well, it actually means also leaving her husband and leaving her daughter I think those kinds of things are super interesting to read as a Christian, because again, it's a story and you kind of see it doesn't work all that. It doesn't work out super well for her. Um, so that is the novel that I've most recently read. That's why I asked the question. I mean, I, the guests I have on gospel bound, they're writers, but every writer I know, especially if they're successful at all at their craft, they're readers. Yeah. Um, and so you always get some interesting answers there. Jen Pollock Michelle has been my guest on Gospel Bound. Check out her new book, A Habit Called Faith 40 Days in the Bible to Find and Follow Jesus. Jen, as always, you're one of my favorite guests. Thank you for joining uh, me on Gospel Bound. Thank you, Colin. This was fun. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Gospel Bound. For more information, including past episodes, transcripts, and to sign up for my newsletter, go to tgc.org slash gospelbound. If you like what you've heard, you may also like my new book written with Sarah Zalstra called Gospel Bound, Living with Resolute Hope in an Anxious Age. 
You can find it wherever books are sold. Thank you.